No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know exactly if I would be preaching here or not. I, I figured I would if Brother Jonathan asked me to, and if not, I'm uh, very well content to sit back and get fed myself because I need it. I need it. This week I've been I've been to revival after revival and place after place. It seems like and. Somehow or another, today I walk into the house of God feeling a little stale. Has anybody been like that a little, sure. a little bit before? Have you walked into the house of God after getting fed great spiritually just the night before, feeling a little stale instead of feeling revived? You see, I've been there and I've been there today. And on my way here I said, Lord, if you want me to preach, I'll preach. But God, I'm like, you're going to have to make him ask me before I ever get up and do it. And I, I remember as soon as he come up and asked me, I said I will. Because I'm ready at any time to give an answer for the hope that is within me. I'm ready at any time to do what it is that God has called me and bid me to do. Are you willing to do that today at whatever time God chooses to ask you? There's been so much that's been said today. You're not getting in the way of the preacher by speaking. I can tell you that because everything that's being said is lining up. I promise you that the song that you sang is lining up. As you began to testify earlier, as you began to preach, everything is lining up. And I praise God for that because as I began to just pray right there as the music was going, I said, God, I said, I need you. I need that anointing to be able to do this. There's not been a time that I've ever been able to do this without you, but I feel stale right now. And I began to feel that anointing begin to pour out again. And God be praised for that. And He said to me what was said to Peter. The words of the Lord came to remembrance. And He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So God, if you will, anoint me tonight, God, to speak not my word, but your word that you've given, God. Not for my will, not for my own vain glory, God, but for your glory, for the edification, for the enlightenment of your people in your church, God, so that we may draw closer to you, even unto the fullness of your stature, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. And what God has given me, I give to you. This was given to me probably, probably midways through last year. And I remember the day, the very day that God gave it to me. And I remember the way that God gave it to you. Does anybody remember the day that God reached down and shook you on the inside and woke you up? If you will, turn with me. To Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 16. Ezekiel 24, 16. God says, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. He says that he's going to take away your desire. And I stand before you today. You've got to see what God has made, what he has fashioned out of this lump of clay. Let me tell you, I was truly that lump of clay that was marred in the potter's hand. And I was that one that was going out seeking hope and I was seeking pleasure in the things of the world. And it always brought me up uh, just a little short-handed. There was a pleasure for a season in all of these things that I was seeking. I could find a good time in it. I could find my comfort in it for yet a while. But it would bring me up empty-handed. You see, I, I, I laid it down as a comfortable carpet to stand on. And it will appear that way. But let me tell you, that once you begin to stand on it for yet a while, the enemy will jerk that out right from underneath you. And that's what would happen to me time and time again. And I praise God that there's not one of us that's truly surrendered our hearts to Him today that He has left the same way that He found us. You see, He didn't leave me the same way that He found me, seeking comfort and seeking a good time in drugs and in alcohol, in a bottle and in partying. He didn't leave me with the same desires that I once had. He said, Behold, Son of Man, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Do you still have 
the same desires that you once had when you were a sinner walking now as a saint. If you do, I want you to look, examine yourselves to see whether you're, you are of the gospel or not. I want you to look within yourselves. God, prepare our hearts, God. Prepare our hearts for this. Till up our hearts, God. So that the word, that seed can be planted in fruitful ground, God. So that it may may bring forth fruit unto you today. You see, once you truly give your life to God uh, in servitude to Him, He's not going to leave you the same way. You're not going to have the same desires. I stand before you completely renewed today. Completely new. You see, is that not the appeal? Is that not the appeal in a Christian life? Is that not why people that are in sin out there, is that not what makes them admire a Christian? There was an atheist that once said, you want to know the only thing that I admire about you Christians is your ability to forgive. He said, that's it. He said, because I can't do it. And you want to know what? I couldn't do it. Because like you were saying, there were so many people out there that I had ought against And that I had bitterness towards. But you want to know what? When I began to live my life in servitude unto God. When I surrendered my heart unto Him. He gave me something. He gave me something. And He didn't give me something. But He gave me, as Brother Jonathan says, He didn't give me it. He gave me Himself. And He didn't just hold anything back from me. He gave all. And He wants us to give all right back to Him today. You see, He did not leave me. Nor did He leave you the same way that He found you if if you've truly rendered your whole heart unto Him. You see, what does the word servitude mean? I've said it a couple times now. Servitude defined means the state of being a slave. How do you like the sound of that? I worked with a man one time. And he, he worked with me in the prison system. And when Paul said there in the book of Ephesians, I, Paul, a prisoner... To Jesus Christ. He said, I don't like that he said that. Because this man had an undying hatred within his heart. Though he claimed to be a Christian. Though he claimed to be born again. You see, if I I remember correctly, Paul said, remember those who are in bonds as if you yourself are in bonds with them. There are those who are in very much so literal bonds in the prison. And there are very much those who are in bonds spiritually. Bonds of depression. Bonds of alcoholism. Bonds of addiction. Bonds of... of of pornography, of idolatry, no matter what it is, you can be in a bond to it. You see, we've got to understand that He puts a love in our hearts. Yes, He does. He changes us completely. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old man has passed away. All things are made new. All things. You see, I had love in my heart for these people. He said, I don't like the sound of that. Do you like the sound of that servitude? The state of being a slave. How about this? Or completely subject to someone more powerful than yourself. Was it you who saved yourself? Or was it the blood of Jesus Christ? The atonement for your sins that saved you. You see, I am completely Under servitude to Him. I am completely indebted to my Savior for what He's done for me. You see, do you like that word? Servitude. Servitude. Do you like the definition? There was a story once given. Lined up with what was given us there in the book of Exodus in chapter 20. The the law of the slave. It says that if somebody owed someone a debt, that they would go and they would work for him for a certain amount of time. And at the end of that time accounted for, that that person, if he wanted to, he could leave. But if he had attained anything like a wife, or if he had had children while he was under his master's guidance, he was to leave it there. But, but if he loved his master, and if he say, I love my master, he could stay and he could dwell in that house. You see, what, I, what I've come to find is that I am. I am completely subjected in servitude to someone I owed a debt to that I could never repay. And I'm t- here to tell you today that what I found in the Master's house is better than any hope, is better than anything, is better than any encouragement that I thought I could ever find out there. And I am happy to dwell in the Master's house today. There was a story of a slave 
They had brought him up before this group of people. They were going to sell him off. He was an old slave. And he said, I won't go. I won't work anymore. I won't work anymore. I won't do what you all tell me to do. So they began to put a price on his head. And people began to, to lift up and to bid on this man one after the other. And he said, I won't work for you. And they said, we'll show him. We'll show him. So the bids began to get higher and higher. And then out of the crowd, somewhere out of the crowd, there was just an enormous bid that comes up that no man could match. And so he took that person. And as, they, as he brought him along in the wagon, the master leaves his wagon and comes right back there with him. And he says, look, look out the window here. Do you see these fields? Do you see these hills? Do you see this house over here? He said, I told you I will not work for you. He said, no. He's like, you don't understand. He said, I did not buy you to make you a slave. I purchased you to set you free. All that I have out here, I give unto you. And that's what Christ did with you and I. It was the bid that was lifted above every bid. He did not buy us to make us enslaved to Him. But He said, He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you want to know what? It is a joy for a Christian to keep the commandments of their Savior. There is joy in it today. He takes away the desires that we once had. And once you truly give your life to servitude to Him, He's going to change the desires of your eyes. Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desire of thy heart. And there are so many people out there, can you believe today, that will try that will try to, to make a fool out of God with all this lust in their heart. You know, the Bible says that you have not because you ask not, and you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. Because you think that the Lord is going to give you something just because you come to the house of the Lord and just because you come to an altar when there are still things that you've held on to, things that you harbored within your heart that you never would let go of. God is not a fool. He is not mocked. Amen. He is not mocked today. There are things that we as Christians have held on to. And if God ever gave me anything as an evangelistic outreach of a message, it was this. It was this. It's time for us to come into that separation unto God. It's time for His church, for His body, for His bride to separate from those things out there that are coming against us that will make us Fruitless. You see, he, he gave to us in the parable of the sower of the seeds, the seeds that were sown among thorns. And there are so many of the Christians today, so many of the children of the king that are sown among the thorns. And what did it say? What did it say would happen when you're sown among thorns? It says that the deceitfulness of riches and that the cares of this life choked the fruitfulness right out from them. And too long we have mingled with those things that have choked the fruitfulness out of the church. What have we done? The church, the body of Christ. What we should be is His hands and His feet, His mouth, His lips, His tongue. We should be able to be used of God to walk as He walked, to act as He acted, to heal as He healed, to encourage as He encouraged, to speak as He spoke. They were called Christians first in Antioch. Why? Why? Because in all the things that they did, it resembled Christ. And what are we doing today? What have we done to the body? What have we done to the body of Christ? What have we done? Have we began to walk among, uh, uh, away from the, 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 the very way that Christ would have us? Have we began to walk in opposition of His commandments? Or do we walk in them? Just because you don't have a call on your life to preach or to teach or to evangelize does not mean that you're not a minister of this gospel. What you don't understand is that the way that you live your life will preach something. It'll show something about you. How are you living? What's seen about you? What's seen about you? You see, once you give your life to God in servitude. You're not going to have any cares for these other things. All the relationships, the drugs, the alcohol, the pride, the love of self, worldly entertainment, 
The music, the TV that you listen to, your desire for riches and money, they should be no more the distractions that come between you and your God. There should be conviction in your heart. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that He has hit you with it. You want to know how I know? Because the Bible says that He will write His laws on our inward parts and that no man will have to tell Him, know the Lord, for He shall know the Lord because He will make Himself revealed. Furthermore, there in Revelation 14, it says that there's going to be an angel to come out of heaven proclaiming the everlasting gospel in every nation, in every tongue, among every kindred. He's going to make Himself known. He's going to make you know where you're falling short, but it's up to you to take that step. And until you take that step, until you take that step, that thing that you've been holding on to, that the Lord's been telling you to drop, it's going to eat away at you as a canker sword does. It's going to eat a hole through you spiritually and it's going to cause you to become fruitless. I promise you this. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 36. This is one of the first scriptures that ever began to speak to me after I gave my heart to the Lord because I'd fallen on some hard times. And it says right there in, in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 31, it says, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded of your own ways, O house of Israel. Be ashamed of it. Brother, I was so thankful when I heard you say that you were not proud of the man that you were because too many times I've heard people speak up unknowledgeably, Christian people speaking up saying I am what my past made me. I am who I am today because my past. Let me tell you that the only thing that your past ever did for you today was make you a sinner. Was make you one that was deserving of hell and a grave. The only thing that your past did for you today was dig you a grave. You are not who you are today, O oh Christian, because your past created it. You are who you are today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are who you are today because of that sacrifice that He gave for you, the atonement of your sins. You are who you are today today because it says up here he says a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them you shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all of your uncleanness. He just said He's going to give you a new heart. He's going to give you a new spirit. He's going to take you out from among the heathen is what it says in Scripture prior to that. Amen. So how is it that we, a blood-bought, supposedly born-again church body of Christ, are walking carnally. Paul says, are ye not yet carnal? Because there are still strives and contentions among you. So I'm saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. We argue about all the worst things. He says, who is Paul? Who is Apollos but fellow laborers together that minister unto you the gospel? There are so many contentions in the church today that's drawing them away from the true heart of God when He's trying to draw us together in unity. And we've got to get back to the Word of God without it. Without it. I fear that we're going to fall off and we're going to be that one that stands before God one day and we're going to say, many things I have done in Your name, Lord. Many things. I've cast out demons. I've done all these good works in Your name. And He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew You. Because we could not walk in the commandments of the Lord. But I tell you today that yes, yes you can. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that you've not come unto the mount that cannot be touched, but you've come unto Mount Sion and an innumerable company of angels and the mediator Jesus Christ. What he's trying to say, you've not come to something that you can't take hold of, that you can't grasp. He says that you've come to something that you can take hold of. He's come to something that you can walk. You can do all these things that are said that we are able to do through the Spirit. That Jesus Christ has given us. You see, you see, He's going to breathe life into something that you thought was dead. Is it not enough? Is it not enough that we walk this way 
You see, you might be hesitant to lay down whatever it is that God's told you to drop in times past. I'm not fooled. He's done it with me. I'm, I'm fearful today. I'm fearful today for the church, and here's why. And here's where I, 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 I'll reach the apex of the message. And uh, go, go ahead and come to, come to the music. I'm going to come to a close real quick. It might be a long close, but I'm coming to it. You might be in the same place that I was when I began to read Ezekiel 34 or 24, 16. Because it troubled me when I read it. You want to know why it troubled me? It troubled me because there was something that I was still holding on to that hindered me from getting to where God was calling me to be. Though He had caused other desires to cease in my life, though He had taken the desire for all the partying, though He had taken all the desire from the drugs, from the alcohol, and all these other things that I was seeking peace, there was still a desire within my heart. And I was holding on to it. Are you still holding on to a desire today? Are you still holding on to a hope of something that's hindered you? That's held you back from the way that God would want to work in your life? You see, you can begin to do great and miraculous things. You can see the Lord move among you. But so many people, so many people will allow those weights to hold them back. The desires in your heart that the Lord said, won't you give it up? Won't you lay it down today before me? They allow them to weigh them down and never give them up because they don't truly trust the Lord. You see, I had that same, that same desire on my heart. And even though He had freed me before, I was grieved when I read it because He placed, because I placed too much hope in a worldly desire and the Lord soon broke me of His grief. And how did He break it? He broke it through His Word. In Numbers 33, verse 51, He says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all the molten images and quite pluck down all their high places and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein. For I have given you the land to possess it. He has given you all of this to take hold of. All of these promises that He's given. The promise of comfort where He says in John 14, He says, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. The contentment that He offers you, you can take hold of today if you dispossess, if you drive out all the inhabitants of the land. So that thing that you're holding on to will cause you to become unfruitful. He goes on to say in verse 55, but if you will not, drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and you shall, you shall be vexed in the land wherein you dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. What a horrible thing. What a horrible thing. Here I was. I had come to God. I had cried out. I had repented of my sins. I had turned. I had been born again. But here I was holding on to a desire of my heart that was hindering me from Him. And through a dream, through a dream, God spoke to me about a year and a half ago. And it was a dream that I had had several times. A reoccurring dream. For ten years, I've had this dream. Time after time, and in times past, I walked in this dream in between my house and where my granny's house is, just a stone's throw away from mine in the field between us. And as I walked in this field, the winds picked up, a storm blew in, and then a tornado came through. And no matter how hard it seemed that I ran to get back home, it would always suck me up in times past. But then last year, something broke. Something was different. I had separated myself onto a walk with God, seeking Him above all else, even though I was still holding on to that desire and He had made it known and He had pleaded with me time and time again, won't you lay it down? Won't you give it up? Won't you let go of it? So that I can use you the way that I desire to use you. And I would not. And through this dream, He spoke to me. The same dream. I was there in the same spot. The winds blew. The storm rolled in and here comes the twister. But there was something different in this dream this time. There was a shed right there. 
There was a storm door on the shed that I could see through. And as I went to run away, I ran on one side of the shed. The, the tornado passed on the other side of the shed. And it ripped that side of the shed off. And through the storm door, I could see all kinds of bags of garbage, trash of all sorts laying a, a, all over this building. And the only thing that that storm was sucking up into it was the trash, was the garbage, was the sin. You see, in times past, that building had been me. We have harbored so much garbage, so many weights from the things that we allow our eyes to see, from the things that we allow our ears to hear, from the things that we allow ourselves to hold on to. But within that shed, I saw something. There was a stool that sat in front of the door. And it was beautiful in my eyes for some reason. Maybe it's just because it was something that I had sat on for so long. How long have you been sitting on the thing that God's been asking you to drop? How long? And I saw that and I said, I don't want this storm to take that from me. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to save this. I'm going to spare this. It has use. It has worth. It has purpose. So I ran and I got it and I packed it under my arm. And as I was running with it in this dream, the storm sucked me back about 10 feet. And I said to myself, if I continue to hold on to this, this is going to be the death of me. If you continue to hold on to it today, it will be the death of you. I promise you that. So I let go of it in the dream and immediately it was sucked up into the vortex. And for the first time in that dream, I finally made it home. And as soon as I opened my eyes from that dream, God spoke to me. What His Word says in the beginning of Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, For that we have so, so many, such a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Let us lay it aside. Let's cast it off today. Let's lay it down at the foot of the cross. Let's lay it down at the altar. Let's finally come to that place of servitude. Let's come to that place of surrender and finally give it up. I knew what he was speaking to me about for many years after I come to the Lord. He dealt with me because I, I had so much hope for a worldly relationship with another. I had just come out of a relationship three years ago. I loved this girl, but God had spoke something to me as I prayed about the relationship and he said no. And I did not understand at the time why he said no. But as the relationship progressed, we dated for about three years. I did everything that I could to provide for her. I rented her a place. I got her out of a drug-ridden home when she had never touched a drug. That she had never been the one to give herself unto alcohol. She was in the church every time the door was open. She had to look down on the outside. But God looks also on the inward. God knows the heart of people. And He knew her heart. And He knew my heart. And He knew the weight that she was going to be to me. She knew the hindrance, or he knew the hindrance that she was going to be on me. And in this relationship, it was right around the time that I was called to preach. Here I tried to justify one thing after another. Not but a year and a half in, I caught wind that she was seeing someone all along. You see, God will try to spare us of heartache before we ever come to it. But we are such a foolish and stiff-necked people that we will pass on through when He gives us commandment, when He bids us and begs us to lay it down. He's trying to spare you of heartache to come today. He's trying to give you something better, something greater, something more. And it might not seem like it's something that you want to lay down. You might not see why it's going to benefit you. To lay this down to give this up but Jesus spoke one time and he said there is not one who has separated themselves under the gospel that is left behind home wife and children that's left behind possessions that will not receive manifold more in this present time and everlasting life to come he's got more in store for you if you'll lay it down but if you'll not I promise you they will only be a prick in your side they will only be thorns in your eyes it will only be problematic for you. I can tell you that of a certainty today. You see, if you continue to hold on to this desire when God has begged you to lay it down, it says something about you. 
it says something about you. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world passes away, but, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. About the time that I was called to preach, God asked me to give something up. God asked me to lay something down that I had gone against His will and held on to anyways. That relationship. He said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot hold to two masters. You will hate one and love the other. He said, choose this day. Will you lay it down? Will you let it go for my sake? He says, you have to choose between me and her. You can see today who I chose. Three years now, I have walked in that way. And there was still just such an overwhelming weight in my life that I'd held on to. A hope and a desire for a relationship. And it was a weight and it was a hindrance to me. It's not a sin to desire a relationship. But if it's something that you hold on to, so hard that grieves you in your spirit day in, day out. You can bet it's going to be a weight from the walk that God has called you to. From the purpose that He has set before you. When you allow it to keep you out of church. When you allow it to drive you to the state of depression. Whether or not you might find a move of the Holy Ghost from whatever you're struggling with right now that you've held on to. Whether or not you might find that move of the Holy Ghost in the house of the Lord. Whether you might find it even in your home from times to times. But that weight is still upon you. Maybe you've had it for many years. I held it for years. For two and a half years I held it. And this has been the most content I've been in my life. Through that dream. He says you're going to have to let go of whatever it is that you're holding on to. Let go of the weights. Cast them aside. Won't you push them aside? Won't you drop them today? Why don't you bring them to the altar? You see... I had to drop it. And I didn't go there. I didn't let it die there. I wished I would have. But it caused me such more grief. He tried to spare me of more heartache to come. Yet I passed on through. And I bore more heartache after more heartache. Depression after depression. Cried tear after tear. Looked in the mirror every day with tear-filled eyes at myself and said, I hate you. I hated the man that I was. But I can tell you today, as I stand before you completely renewed, after I laid that weight aside. You see, God made that weight completely and seemingly unbearable on me. Because I passed on through. Because I did not lay aside everything, every weight, every sin. Because I did not dispossess every inhabitant of the land. He asked us for all. He asked us for all. So won't you give all? Won't you give all today and know He's got greater things in store for you. I remember going to Him with that broken and that contrite spirit and just pouring myself out and I said, Lord, this isn't what I want. But I know a man. I know a man that cried out once in the garden and said, if this be Your will, God, if You will, let this come pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. But your will be done. And I said it that day. And I meant it that day. Because I could not bear the grief. And the sorrow. And the bitterness that it brought me anymore. It had been too much. It had been too many pricks. It had been too many thorns in my side. But I'm here to tell you today. That God can bring you back. Into that comfort. That God can bring you back. Into contentment. But you see. You see, we've got to lay it down. When Elijah restored, repaired the altar, there was something that he had to give. There was something that he had to pour upon that sacrifice before it was ever accepted of God. What he held dear. It was what they held dear at that time. They were in a drought. He had to take water barrel after barrel after barrel time and time again and pour upon that sacrifice. Something seemingly valuable. Something that was dear in the land. God wants all. Before your sacrifice will be accepted. 
Why don't you bring everything that you have? Why don't you bring it today? Why don't you bring it and turn your hearts unto the Lord again? Turn and look, examine yourselves and turn again unto the Lord. The writer of Lamentations says, Come on today, let's fill these altars as we give it up. In, in Hosea, verse 10, 10, if God ever showed me anything, He showed me this. He says, it is, it is in my desire that I shall chastise them when they bind themselves together in their two furrows. And I cannot think of a time worse than today when the church is mingled together in the same furrow with the ungodly. It is God's desire that He chastise them when we bind ourselves together in the same two furrows. And He wrote there in the book of Psalm 65.10 and He says, Thou waterest the ridges thereof. Thou sendest the rain upon the furrow. The rains of this life the storms are synonymous with storms with the hard times of this life. And I know that we've endured them. I know that we've experienced them. But you see, there's coming a day of harvest. As it says there in Matthew 13, 30 in the parable of the wheat and of the tares. Go there with me. Go there with me. He says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, the church... His people have fallen asleep. We've fallen asleep right on the pew. While men slept, an enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. And you want to know what happened that day? The wheat grew among the tares. And he said, an enemy has done this. Let them grow up together. Lest when you up, go to uproot them now, that you may tear both of them up and take them up before their time has come to fruition. He says right there in Psalm 65.10 that He sends the rains, that He waters the ridges thereof of the furrow. It is easiest, I tell you today. There has never been a call of separation as urgent and as desperate as it is today for the church. It is easier to pluck up something from the ground when it's wet. When the rains have passed upon it, it's easier to pull up, to uproot when it's wet. I believe that that time of harvest is coming soon. And I believe it's time for us to stand up to get back to the commandments and to the statutes and walking in His ordinances that He has given to us. Because you see what happened in the book of Chronicles when a king would decide, we've not followed this way for so long. When, we, when they began to walk in the statutes again and the ordinances of God, it says that there was great revival in the land. That there was joy to be found. My contentment was found when I laid down the weights that were hindering me. You see, these things are going to weigh you down and bind you in that furrow. I can promise you this, unless you will lay them down. Unless you will set yourself apart in servitude unto the Lord. And then, in His perfect timing, in process of time, He will give you that comfort. No matter what trial you pass through, yes, you will face tribulation. But Jesus said, you will have tribulation in this world. But to take courage, because I have overcome this world. He will give you peace right there in the midst of that storm, I promise. Let's pray today. Let's pray today. Let's lay aside the weights. Let's lay aside the sins. Let's lay aside the things that we had held on to for so long. It's hindered a move of God in our lives. You see, it's oftentimes... Those things, the same things that we hold as dear and don't want to let go of that hold us back from a move of God in our lives. But I promise you today that you can feel the fire of God again in your life if you would bring that. If you would just surrender all unto Him. If you would bring it all. So let's pray today. Get here, how did I drift so far? 